Welcome, everyone. It is Saturday, and it is February 24th, the last Saturday, to my knowledge, in Black History Month. So we are happy that you are joining us, and our topic today is African Americans' role in World War II and World War I. You are getting ready to have a very interesting discussion about World War I and World War II and the African Americans' role during that time. I kind of like to start off with a little Charleston trivia. And what do you think is the size of a football field and a half? What well, is located at Gadsden's Wharf? What has nine galleries? I hope I'm piquing your interest now. Who has a Center for Family History that provides educational programs for visitors, both young and old? Who has membership opportunities? All of these answers and more can be found on the International African American Museum main page. And for any events that are coming up, you will be able to go right to program and events and see what else is coming up via the Center for Family History. So this is a slide just giving you a little snapshot of what's there. You see we have a resource center, digital archives. There's also ways for you to contribute some of your family history. So please visit the International African American Museum Center for Family History website. We also offer one-on-one -on -one uh, genealogy consultations, a 45-minute consultation, and you can find more information also on that page. So just a few reminders. The session is being recorded, and it will be put up within the next couple of weeks on the YouTube channel. Please keep yourself muted and turn off your video during the discussion that's going on today. Closed caption is available for whoever wants it. And if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box that's available. And we have Whitney here from the museum that will monitor them and we will address them after the discussion. So let's say welcome to our guest. We have Angela Watt-Raji, who is a genealogist and an author. We have Dr. Alfred Brothers, who's a veteran and a genealogist, and both of them have much more, but I am not going to share the their bios because they're on the website. So I want to go ahead, stop sharing, and then allow them to introduce themselves. And there we go. Angela, would you like to say where you're, not where you're coming in, but what you're working on? I see that book in the back behind you. Please share a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, unmute You're yourself. Unmute. I'm okay. unmuted now. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Walton Raji, and it is a pleasure to be here and to speak with people who are part of the International Museum's family, I'll say. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a genealogist and a writer and a blogger and podcaster and all that good stuff. Uh, coming to you from Maryland, I'm working on, of course, another book on a particular community in uh, northeastern Oklahoma in LaFleur County, Scullyville, which was the northern district of the Choctaw Nation. And I'm focusing on the Freedmen families, the Choctaw Freedmen families individuals who'd once been enslaved in the Choctaw Nation had been taken west on the Trail of Tears and ended up living there, and many still do uh, to this day. And so that's my current project. But um, other things that keep me busy, like coming to <laughs> the International Museum to speak. So thank you, Shelley. Yes, well, we're welcome, and we are ha welcome to you and happy to have you. Dr. Brothers, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, thank you so very much for for inviting me and, and including me in the program. It's interesting. My background is I went to the oldest public high school in the country, Boston Latin School, founded in 1635. Oh, so my again, goodness. I, and I was not one of the first students. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Boston University College of Engineering and then then went into the Air Force uh, uh, by Air Force ROTC. So I spent 22 years in the Air Force 
flying fighters and bombers. I was in Vietnam twice. Uh, and, and then uh, later on, uh, uh, much to my uh, parents' surprise, I actually got involved in engineering at the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I, again, in my area was space systems in that, in that sense, too. So it was, it was fun ex at that time, you know, exploring, in this case, both Russian and uh, Chinese space systems as the Chinese program evolved. And of course, the uh, Russian program was much more evolved. Uh, when I when I went to work for uh, Raytheon here in Fort Wayne, again, uh, I only expected to be here five years. I've been here over 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the key thing for me here is that the Allen County Public Library is, yeah. is a great resource here and, and I have, have some great friends. So I've been doing uh, genealogy research for about 45 years. Yeah. And, and most of our folks, my folks, come from Virginia, uh, Maryland, and D.C., uh, obviously New England, but also Nova Scotia. So again, it's a wide wow. area uh, yes. to cover, and, and it's been fun. But then, uh, But one of the key things I've been involved in has been being a military genealogist, you know, again, nice. uh, working with Maggie, providing, uh, you know, a couple of courses on that, but also uh, with my local uh, society, the uh, African-American Genealogy Society of Fort Wayne, providing monthly programs and uh, free programs. And they're also on uh, uh, YouTube, uh, again, to the uh, general public and also to our uh, our members. And it's been fun because what often uh, they've given me a challenge saying, can you tell me about this? So my job is go back and see what yes. I can find out right now. I'm, Finishing up a course with Boston University, their, their program on, on genealogy. And, and, it's, and it's been fun. Again, yes, I, I've been doing it for a good number of years, but it's always something I can learn. And that's I think it. That's for all of us, uh, again, when you get a chance, uh, again, just costs a little bit of money. But, but again, there are other uh, view, uh, free things on, 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 on uh, uh, for example, YouTube and other, th uh, other things like that that you can learn about. So please, uh, genealogy has, has been a, a journey for me, a, a continuing journey as, as I investigate, particularly in my family. Uh, again, uh, it's been interesting to find out how some of them survived. I had 21 family members in in uh, the Civil War, mm -hmm. only one died, and and uh, uh, and and, and uh, I, I've had uh, six or seven in in World War II. Only a couple of us in in Vietnam. So again, it's interesting as as we look through the process mm -hmm. how each family is involved one way or another. That's awesome. And again, welcome to you. And I want that since he mentioned Maggie, because I was going to also introduce that both of you are instructors at Maggie, which Maggie is the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute. They are heading into year 12 in 2024. It's a three day genealogy institute that's fairly focused on African American ancestry. It is not a conference, just to make sure people are distinguishing. And, and I'm going to say, because conferences, you don't have homework. <laughs> and conferences, you don't have hands-on type situation. And, and this year will be the first time back to Fort Wayne at the Allen County Public Library since COVID. And so we're excited about it and happy that they agreed to still host us and they've been waiting for us to come back yes. at any time. <laughs> That's yes, true. They have. So yes, they be have. Before I start with the, some questions for the discussion, I do want to give a hello to the people that are in the conference room at the International African American Museum. We have Brian Sheffy there, who is the director of the Center for Family History, and their questions will also come in through the chat. And so again, welcome all of you that are attending and let's get going and get this discussion going. And again, this is our last um, episode from the series for Black History Month and African-Americans in the role of the military. Last Saturday, we had the Civil War and about women. And so okay. today, again, it's World War I and World War II. And all I'm going to say for the record is it doesn't matter what war or conflict that was going on, African and African Americans were there yep. and involved in all different ways of involvement. So we're coming down to this one. So the first question I want to put out, and, and Angela, I'll kind of start with you, and then we'll have Dr. Brothers chime in and vice versa, is could you describe the variety of roles that you're familiar with 
that the African Americans did play in World War I and World War II? Well, it's very interesting um, uh, in terms of looking at things. Obviously, looking at the First World War, you found women who wanted to join and assist in the war effort. They were in a support role primarily. You had some who, in fact, went really out of their way to participate. Some who ended up working with the YMCA in, uh, in Europe, others who were with the Red Cross. And so it was a situation where they were not necessarily trained soldiers per se or went through a boot camp experience from the First World War, but it was a little bit different in the Second World War where the um, WAAC, the Women's uh, Auxiliary um, Corps, well, it was WAAC, and women were able to actually enlist in the service mm -hmm. and were actually able to get trained. Um, of course, the Army, as we know, the military itself was segregated at that time, mm -hmm. but uh, women who did sign up uh, were trained and put in segregated units. Um, the unit I'll be talking about a little bit later um, the six triple eight. They were they went through rigorous training as as obviously not as combat soldiers, but as people who had a critical role in terms of mm. things that affected the soldiers directly and particularly their morale. And uh, and it was very very significant because they were able to alleviate a tremendous problem that it happened, I won't say necessarily due to an issue of neglect, but there was this tremendous, tremendous backlog for many, many months. Soldiers on the front line, regardless of unit, color, whatever, they were without contact from home. And this was something that affected morale. And even at the time, um, General Eisenhower was like, wait a minute, if they don't even get, there's no mail call for weeks and months yeah and especially yeah. in 19 we're getting towards now the critical part of the war what's mm -hmm. going on in france what's going on particularly as hitler was really revving up for his sis you know i guess there were four if not five big campaigns he was launching in western europe and the battle of the bulge which was the big one that lasted for weeks from what mid-december to uh late january i don't know the exact date um but, but we know we had women over there. In and Hull. women were actually going to be individuals who are not only serving uh, in a medical capacity in terms of support, mm -hmm. but also in terms of uh, their efforts to alleviate a problem in terms of morale for the soldiers. And I'll be talking about that, too. So, OK, Dr. Brothers. What what do you know, and I know you know, but can you describe some of the roles that African Americans played in both wars? Well, put it this way. Originally, the uh, Army, uh, again, I might point out, uh, in, in World, we had uh, uh, no one involved, no African Americans involved uh, in uh, between the wars in the Navy. As far as that goes, uh, uh, the same thing in the Marines. There were no African American Marines in World War One, it, it did occur in World War Two, but the key things the Army expected them to to be in support roles, uh, for civil engineering, logistics, transportation, and they, in some cases, were in fact directly involved in combat. Uh, mm -hmm. And and again, uh, the uh, the one in World War One that was the most interesting was the 369th Infantry Division, uh, and they were called the Harlem Hellfighters. Yeah. Oh. They, they served the longest on the front lines in World War One. Yes. So, uh, so again, and they received tremendous, you know, uh, uh, accolades from the French yes. in that sense too. So it gave them a chance again to pull together, you know, collectively as 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 African Americans and and fight a war. So this really was the first time since the Civil War where a large number of African American males pulled together and trained together. Uh, uh, for me, it was interesting to see how they got there. Obviously, they went by ship. <laughs> yeah. sure, not, sure, again, sure. again in, in in both wars, and I've got pictures of you know at home here of the ships my uh, my father went on in, in in World War II. Okay, great. But, but, but as you look at it again, the, the key uh, groups were like the seven sixty first Black Tank Battalion uh, mm. that that Patton depended on. You know, in, in that sense too, the Tuskegee Airmen in both the 332nd fighter group, and there were bombers as well, and they were the forerunners for me. The airplane you see in the back, I've flown a couple of different kind of military airplanes, the FB-111. There were only two African-American pilots that ever went to fly that airplane. 
So I so it gives you a hint, but I flew B-52s It's also. history time. We're getting it. <laughs> Listen to this. Yes. And then uh, in, 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 in the Vietnam War, there were only, there were only two African-American pilots. There were many navigators and radar navigators and right. warfare officers. But when I went over, I was the only one. So this leads me to the next question. And I'll start back with you, Dr. Brothers, because you opened that door. And then I'll go to Angela. What were some of the challenges that African Americans faced due to segregation and discrimination during these times and especially these global conflicts? Right. What was going on? And again, for the folks attending, you're hearing things which also lead to records. He right. did. So everything that you hear will lead you to a record. And again, we'll take your questions, you know, at the end, just put them in the Q&A box. Okay, Dr. Brothers. One of the key things that really defined uh, uh, both of those wars initially on, uh, in particularly in World War One, they were not be actually being part of an actual defined fighting unit. And that was also initially true in World War II. Because remember, Eleanor Roosevelt had to step up, you know, and get down to Tuskegee before we actually got uh, African Americans flying, as, as far as that goes too. Uh, so uh, again, another thing is like uh, no African Americans served the Marines since after the Revolutionary War. The Secretary of Defense made a policy that there'd be no African Americans in the Marine Corps until World War II. Mm. So, uh, so, uh, so a big difference. Uh, the Navy was likewise absent of, of African Americans between 1919 and 1932. They couldn't join the Navy. Now, if, now, if you look back at the Revolutionary War yes. and the Civil War, Blacks served alongside uh, 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 white Americans in both the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. There was, again, the ship was too small <laughs> in, that, in that sense. So, so uh, that means there's probably some records back there and oh, some other time. information. Big time. And and again, there are separate Black units in both World War One and World War Two. Most <laughs> units were segregated. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the black units were trained separately for white units and given non-combat roles particularly and typically were commanded by white officers. But there are some exceptions. We'll talk a little bit about it a, a, a later on. Okay. But it, the exceptions of combat groups were the Tuskegee Airmen and, and, and things like where my father served in the 366th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. Again, 366, 369. Now, there were actually four of them that served particularly in World War II as combat units. They were supposed to be support units and trained as support units but they actually became frontline fighting units. So again, there was a, a big deal. Uh, the segregation and discrimination was also true in the Coast Guard and the Merchant Marines, uh, but in the Merchant Marines was, was to a lesser extent. Mm -hmm. Again, when you take a look at, uh, you know, segregation, it only ended by the uh, order of President Harry, Rose, ha Harry Truman in July 1948 by his, by his executive order. Mm -hmm. A chance to meet his grandson. Uh, and, and and talk to him uh, about it because and and th obviously thank him for what his grandfather did, but learn a little bit more about Harry Truman himself. Again, the man who served in World War One. One. So so Angela, I mentioned about some of the challenges faced due to segregation and discrimination. Will you tie that also to genealogical research? Um. Well, of course, I think. As we tell story, we're storytellers as genealogists, and we have to understand, just put yourself, if you can, mentally in the place where your ancestors were. And as I look, for example, at the role that women played frequently in support roles, obviously, but even when they were in a foreign environment, they had some challenges that they had to face. Uh, you look at um, even the response that people gave in both England and in France towards African-American women. When you look at how, oh, because socially, if they had that, oh, because they worked in eight hour shifts, but socially they're interacting with the local community. They had the challenge of changing the perception that the local population had about people of color. And here were women coming in now and they began to realize that these women are actually very cordial. Oh my goodness. They, they had to really go through a mental exercise of changing their perception mm -hmm. of of women of color, but women of color had that challenge of number one also being female in a mostly male dominated situation, war, and yet 
playing a pivotal role in terms of number one, also maintaining their safety as women who can be vulnerable. But at the same time, they were making changes in the perception that white Europe had towards people of color as well. They had seen since the First World War, men of color in uniform, but here and out women, who, some of whom who had been present as, as Red Cross workers in the First World War, but we're now, you know, a decade and a half later now in a different type of conflict. And so certainly they had a different role to play, even though they were doing their task, their assigned task mm -hmm. as members of the military. Um, they had sort of another, just sort of a human role to play. They were sort of unknowingly ambassadors uh, sure. for really people of color, women of color, and they really opened other kinds of doors. And of course, they also opened up doors after the first after World War II in terms of women and their presence in the military because they were That's so true. efficient at what they did. But uh, it's still interesting. I'm fascinated, though, as Dr. Brothers mentioned, the role of or the presence of Black people in the Navy. What's so ironic, and I think I mentioned this last week, in uh, the Civil War, there were women who actually served and got pensioner became pensioners right. as veterans of the U.S. Navy because they ended up serving in the USS Red Rover, at, which was a floating hospital, serving on water that was U.S. Navy. And people such as Anne Bradford Strokes and others, um, some of whom I think were buried, not too probably not too far from Fort Wayne, uh, who died. But these are women who worked as laborers, obviously. Some were nurses and some were, I think they hired the women in the pay grade. They were hired as first class boy, which was their title. Uh, oh my goodness. But it's so interesting. They played that role in the Civil War. And then as time progressed over the next, what, four, five, six decades, no men could be in the U.S. Navy, at least for some time. And it's it's kind of interesting to hear that. So anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did. You did. Okay. And again, the indication, and in I want to make sure, again, the audience is catching that. You know, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. Because in the chat, we might not catch them. So put them in the Q&A box and Whitney will be able to bring those forward. But when you're talking about the different roles, I'm hearing skilled people mm -hmm. as well. Oh, intelligent. Yes. And even though they might be the average person from a community, they also got trained. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking, and again, I always struggle with that from the Revolutionary War and also to the Civil War. You know, when I think about the research that I personally do, and I'm thinking, these are not always just cooks and service workers. Right. We're seeing skilled people, and, and we they need to be recognized. So let me move to the next question. How did the participation and those contributions of African Americans in either war or conflict lay the groundwork, you think, for the civil rights movement that happened. And and it doesn't matter who wants to take that first, but be, go ahead, Dr. Brothers, because whatever they did had to make something else happen. Something very, uh, very dramatic happened when you think of both of those wars. Uh, their experiences and acceptance overseas with foreign troops and people showed them that work had to be done at home. Yeah. Uh, after you training from both wars, they were not accepted as heroes. And in South, uh, some were actually killed for being in uniform. That's so right. again, when you, when you look at the issues, uh, again, they begin to recognize uh, that work had to be done. They had, to, they had to do something. One of the key things that the military did, again, was form units. They learned how to work together, yes. how to solve problems together. So the military yeah. helped help them do that. Uh, they expected more acceptance, and this laid the foundation for unrest and preparation for national movements. In some cases, they were local movements. The mm -hmm. civil rights movement, again, uh, evolved and, and with the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King. And there were differences in the North and South. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, honestly, sure. we had less problems in the North relative to African-Americans returning home than we did in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of uh, key units so, uh, that, that um, made a difference, the AMVETS, for example, the VFW, those kind of things, our men joined. 
you know, again, and, and I remember uh, the MVET uh, organization that my father was part of and, and led at, at, at a point really kept them together and kept them focused on their mission to make a difference in their community. And that was the difference. Again, when you pull them in together and allow them to discuss, particularly when they come from all over the country, sure. you begin to get a bigger picture of what the country is like or what the country can be like. Mm -hmm. Again, when they go home, particularly those who lived in the same area, they got together. And that's how many of these civil rights movements started. It started overseas. Yes, absolutely. Angela, did you want to add anything? Uh, not, no, I think I, I would just basically agree with what he's saying. And I was thinking to myself, I remember years ago when I was you know, much younger going through my mother's old photo album. And I remember seeing images of, it looked as if it was some party or dance or something. And I remember uh, my mother was talking about how, well, you know, you know, I was a secretary at the USO. And it was like, oh, oh, okay. I didn't realize that. But also I think that um, that ability to, even during a time, now, of course, the army was, was, I won't say long integrated by this time, but um, certainly we're talking in the 1950s or so when she was doing that. But I think the world had realized that Black soldiers, uh, service people, men and women, were human beings who had certain needs as well that needed to be addressed across the board. Um, when I was looking at the role of uh, the women in the post battalion and their effect socially on how it affected the community and people began to see something. And while Dr. Brothers was speaking, I'm trying to remember, and I only consider it like a crack in, in sort of the, the, the wall of segregation. There was a movie that was done. I think it was done in the late, uh, maybe not in the late forties, maybe in the early fifties. It was a black and white movie, but it was about servicemen going to be entertained and you saw some black soldiers coming in and some had purple hearts. And I can't remember the name of the film, but I remember the guy who was letting people into the club and you saw some black men coming in in uniform. And it, it's like a musical that was done. I want to say it was done in the late 1940s or 50s. And it was sort of, you know, support our soldiers. Right, and right. Um, I don't think it wasn't done. And that would probably be the theme of supporting the soldiers. Of the soldiers. But, I'm but shocked the film actually yes. had black soldiers. That, that's coming. what I'm shocked at that. Yes. And I remember seeing that yes. years later thinking, oh, my gosh, they were actually showing black soldiers coming in who needed to be thanked for their service. And yes. um Oh, I wish I could remember the name of the musical, but I think it's those little things that created little cracks in the wall that eventually with time began to, to crumble once the civil rights movement really took off and, and gained its momentum. But there were things like that, that those small little cracks, I think, helped to make the wall crumble a bit more. So, Well, I'm, I'm, this question was not on our little list, but I'm, I'm talking to you, Dr. Brothers. Okay. Vietnam. Mm -hmm. When those guys and women came home, they were broken. This 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 country didn't welcome them home. No, and we have, and my brother is one, but and and you as well, but we have thousands and thousands okay. that the work and the service that they did was not appreciated by this country. And I think of the civil rights movement were making those little cracks as she referred to that, but we're still dealing with that on Vietnam in some aspects. Is that not correct? In terms of mental fitness, the answer is yes. Again, because many of our men, particularly, again, because they were the fighting force at that time, still have scars from that. Yeah. Oh, still absolutely. have not recovered any way, shape, or form. You yeah. see him at the VA hospital, particularly when, when, when you go there. It's it was a hard time because unlike World War II or World War I when they came back, they were readily accepted. They had parades, the whole bit. Yeah. You know, and 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 in many cases, when we came home on the airplanes, they told us, "Don't wear your uniform." Right. Mm -hmm. so I, I'll, I'll give you one story. I wore my uniform uh, when I came home from uh, Vietnam. Going back uh, to Vietnam, we're going to go to the Middle East. I wore my uniform on the, on the airplane going back because in case the air, uh, they want to capture me in, in, in the Middle East, I had a uniform and they yeah. knew I was an American. I want to, want to point out, uh, we landed in Israel 
And of course, there was a long line of folks, you know, going through, uh, you know, uh, the the lines with uh, 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 in, in Israel. An Israeli soldier again. They had them there. Came up to me and said, "We're, we're going to take you right through. Don't worry about it." Mm -hmm. So I passed by every line that was there. So again, uh, again, there there was a uh, I, I used them a mixed message, you know, mm -hmm. in in that sense. Uh, uh, we home really didn't understand Vietnam. That's the problem. Yes, and I think, I think that, that was the, was the problem. That's and it. and my brother is a hundred percent PTSD, oh, wow. and okay. and Uncle Sam didn't grab him till about 15 years later after oh, he wow. came home. Oh, yeah. So we lived through a lot of, I'm going to say, family community trauma with yes. him and others like him. Yes. And and he's still with us. Great, great. Okay. And, and I'll say it this way, and he's still hanging on a thread. I understand mm -hmm. that part wholeheartedly. Let me tell you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So it's so I kind of want to redirect. And if you want, I'll go to you, Angela, to share your slides. But let's talk about some notable African American units or figures, and then we'll go to Dr. Brothers. But you had some slide. Oh, you're will you talk about six triple eight right now? And then we'll turn it over yeah. to Dr. Brothers. Uh, to talk about some units and as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think just uh, as a quick follow up to what Dr. Brother said, I think this the American mindset. We understood why we were going to war. We understood what was happening in World War One. We understood what was happening in World War Two. You go to a movie, buy your war bonds here at this yeah. thing. Everybody knew there's a bad guy, and we're yeah. the good guys, and we're going over to make yeah. things right. Something was going on in French Indochina. We had no idea what it was. And suddenly young men were being shifted off yeah. to fight in the war. So it people were conflicted. We didn't even understand what it was about. So that's part of that. But in terms of what was happening in Europe, as many of us certainly were aware, uh, in terms of what was going on, it is important, and I, I always love hearing, and, and there have been many documentaries about the 6888, uh, the Postal Battalion, and they have a fascinating history. This is the only unit of Black women, all Black women, that were sent in wartime to serve in Europe. And, uh, well, I'll say out of the U.S., it just happened to be occurring in Europe, um, the 6888 Battalion history. And it's fascinating. There were about 855 women who served in this battalion, and they had to clear up of an incredible backlog of mail. And they did it in record time. There were several years, well, months, but actually it was supposedly at least more than a year's worth of backlog mail that was in the European theater. A lot of mail from the U.S., including packages, Christmas packages, all kinds of things, and letters, of course, that were sent. And they landed in, in England, and they were just stacked in a warehouse in Birmingham, England. And uh, these women were served, uh, were brought there to, to try and address this problem. And they worked around the clock, 24-7, in three eight-hour shifts. And they were absolutely amazing in terms of what they had done. This is an oh. image of some of the backlog of mail. Uh, and there was more than one building full of these. The warehouses were not necessarily uh, great conditions as well. And uh, it was a real problem. And this was beginning to affect morale. We're talking now late 1944. You know, the war ended around September uh, of 45. But by this time, men were really, really, really depressed. No word from home, nothing. And there had to be a problem. And it was having a tremendous effect. If you have people whose morale is low, they're not going to be able to go out of the front line and do their very best, not having even some words of encouragement. And so what was happening was that this postal battalion was formed and even General Eisenhower, he began to address it. You know, soldiers who don't get mail, well, the morale is going to plummet. You can't have soldiers who are not at their best in a critical time, such as a battle. So at this point, Charity Adams, who was by this time a captain, and she had already enlisted in the military in, in 19. 
42 and she was appointed captain of this and they had their ma their motto no male low no morale and it. so they began to organize a new system and after the battle of the bulge which we're talking again mid-december 44 of late january 45 this is at least six to eight weeks of battle incredible and they decided we've got to do something to get our soldiers really ready to push and so they worked in these warehouses that were terrible. They were infested with rodents, all kinds of things, but they got to the job. And there are different images that you'll see of them. They actually created a new tracking system to be able to deal with it. They had to deal with soldiers who had maybe a common name, uh, Robert Smith, but people from home would write it to Bobby, Uncle Bobby, Robert, Robbie, you know, all those things they had to determine and which one of the hundreds of people called Robert Smith is this actually going to. So they had to really create an incredible system. It was believed it was gonna take six months to a year, minimally six months, and they cleared it in three months time, which is absolutely amazing. The leader, Ch um, Charity Adams, who became a Lieutenant Colonel later on, she joined in mid 1942, six months or seven months or so after Pearl Harbor. And she was part of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And she was actually born in North Carolina, but she spent her childhood years in Columbia, South Carolina. You talked about their training. She is an extremely intelligent woman graduated valedictorian of her high school class, went on to get a degree from Wilberforce in math and physics. She was no wow. dummy. This woman was sharp. And she became, of course, a member of the, of the first officer candidate school, which is after which she was sent to Fort Des Moines in Iowa. She was the first Black woman to become an officer in the Women's Army Corps, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And um, of course, we know it was still segregated. So they put her over a black unit at Fort Des Moines. Um, they were the first only women's group, women's battalion to serve overseas of any color. And they were stationed first in England and then later on in France. Um, she, of course, by the time she retired, she was a lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel. Um, but she was also the highest ranking woman in the military at the end of World War, World War II. And it is said that this particular battalion really opened up the doors for other women. They were extremely, extremely efficient. But when they got back, no parades for them, no waving crowds, you know, no ticker tape with all the confetti falling from the skyscrapers, and they just returned to their quiet lives. 72 years later at Fort Leavenworth, a monument was built honoring them. This is at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And of course the bust that you see that is representing um, um, Charity Adams herself. And it's a little bit of a closer image of the actual monument that's there. In 2019, the army finally approved the meritorious unit commendation for the 6888. And finally, in March, not even two years quite yet, in 2022, they were finally given the Congressional Gold Medal. Um, Charity Adams, afterwards, she married a man, uh, Dr. Stanley Early. She met him when he was still a medical student. They settled for a while. They lived briefly in Europe, and then they came back. They had two children. She died in 2002 and is buried in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio. Um, She's a humble woman because you can find documentaries of her um, uh, where she's speaking and talking about her life. And she always says, I was just there to do my job. And um, she worked at the Pentagon very, very briefly as well. But again, uh, and of course, this is her, her uh, grave site. And uh, incredible history. And this is just a regiment we should never forget and just appreciate that. So, and I'll stop. Amazing. It is, it is really quite impressive. It's amazing. And that we didn't know. We didn't know. We know. No knowledge of her. And, and that tells me as they came out, there's records. 
There are records. Well, hopefully they weren't burned in the fire in the warehouse in 1971 in, in St. Louis. Yes. But, uh, yes. but there's a story there. And thankfully, there's a lot of video footage of them. Yes. Right. So that's yeah. really good. And that helps. Yes. Dr. Yes. Brothers, some notable units or individuals, go for it. Okay, let me uh, share my slides here, if I may, here real quick. I'm just proud to be a woman, y'all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> At this point, just hearing, and again, that morale was so critical. So thank you for addressing that, Angela. Sure thing. Okay, and Dr. Okay. Brothers, I do have a couple other questions for you, too. Okay, I just want to give some highlights to put things in, into perspective. When we talk yeah. about, uh, you know, uh, uh there were over four or four point seven million uh, men and, and women who served. Uh, we had three hundred fifty thousand African Americans who served in World War One, and mm -hmm. two percent of all sailors were African Americans. We had fourteen African American women enlisted to serve with the rank of yeoman. Now, uh, notably, as a pilot, uh, there were uh, from World War One. There were two pilots that, uh, that that are interesting. One was an African American pilot, Eugene Jacques Bullard. Again, who uh, flew a uh, flew spad, and, and and is credited with having potentially shot down, you know, uh, two the two German fighters, uh, and there was an African pilot from Somalia who flew for oh. the French. So again, we tend to forget that Africans also participated yeah. in some of these wars, and I just wanted to point that out. So I want to point out the 92nd and 93rd infantry divisions. The 92nd had the 366th, the 93rd had the 69th, 70, 71, and 72. So again, these were the regiments that were involved in World War I. And one key thing was there was one African-American awarded the Medal of Honor in World War I. Now let's take a look at World War II. We had over 16 and a half million soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and 2.5 African-Americans registered for the draft. Uh, but, uh, uh, 1.25 million African Americans actually served in World War II. That's a fantastic number. You talk about again the 97th with the 366. My father was a part of that. My father-in-law was a part of that, and Edward Brooke, the first black center, was also a captain in that same unit. The 93rd again had the 69th, 70th, 70th, and 72nd uh, infantry uh, red regiments. The, these are now all combat regiments. They are not. A service regiments by any stretch of the imagination. We had the 332nd Fighter Group and a 761st Tank Battalion. And they really, uh, again, supported Patton. When Patton was in a bind, he called those guys out. Mm -hmm. The 332nd Fighter Group. The story about that fighter group was how well they defended Allied bombers. Allied mm -hmm. bombers being shot out of the sky, hit on, on, on the way to uh, a bomb. Uh, sites, bombing sites, and in, in, in particularly in Germany, and, and the fighters, the current fighters uh, didn't protect them well. When they allowed the 332nd fighter group to do it, they broke tradition. They um, The original tradition was when enemy fighters attacked, uh, the fighter group would break off and engage them the, and, 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 and not protect the fighters, of uh, the bombers. These guys didn't. There was not one American bomber lost when these guys uh, protected them because they knew how they part would stay in, uh, and, and protect them. The other half would, would, it, would engage the enemy. They knew how to develop a new air combat tactic. The 761st Tank Battalion was likewise a bunch of heroes. These guys were tough. Again, uh, as I mentioned, Patton would send them into, into battles to lead his troops because, again, the regular tank battalions couldn't do the job as effectively. They could break through in certain areas, and they were part of the Battle of the Bulge. Our men disturbed the dissension in the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Coast Guard, and Merchant Marines, despite uh, segregation and discrimination. There were seven Medal of Honor winners. Down below, I want to point out something. To give you an indication, the U.S. population in 1940 was 131, almost 132 million. The Black population was 12.9 million, about 9%. So it, it, it gives you some insights in terms of what was going on in, in that area? Uh, uh, one of the Medal of Honor winners came from my father's outfit. He was uh, uh, set out on a patrol and, and uh, was surrounded by Germans. He was fighting them and ordered an, an, uh, an artillery strike on himself. And uh, 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 
obviously was killed. But again, that helped save the lives of my father, my father-in-law, and Ed Brooke, because again, they were able to break up the uh, German, uh, in, uh, in this case, the German element at that particular point in time. So again, these are the key things that, that are involved. Now, I want to point on the left here is just some in information. Okay. Benjamin Davis Jr. served as a commander of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. He later became the first African-American general, full general in the United States Air Force. But notably, his father, Benjamin Davis Sr., had been the first African-American brigadier general in the Army in 1940. So it gives you some insights. On the right, it's interesting because uh, this is from my father's outfit, the 366. There were two commanders that, uh, that I had pictures of. On the left, Colonel West Hamilton, and on the right, Colonel Howard Owen. So again, there were African-American leaders leading African-Americans in World War II. Get out of here now. I, I am loving this. This is so, so good. Oh, okay, so, let me, go ahead. And I got a follow-up question for both of you. We're talking about the interaction, segregation, discrimination, and the treatment. Yep. But what was going on in the home front? What it's, was the home from experience? home front experience for communities of uh, black folks mm -hmm. what what was going on what was their contributions and is or, or was their contributions from the local black communities and so forth during these wars i think traditionally they provided support to the community itself again yeah. the church and other, other things were the, were the backbone of that area but mm -hmm. the key thing was they kept the uh, uh, communities alive because they had to take uh, the uh, the roles of the men involved in in those areas because all the most of the men not all most of the men were pulled overseas. My grandfather again worked at the post office in that time frame, say and 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 died just after my father got back. But again, you look at the time period, the the telling element of what was going on in the community with the newspapers, in, yes. in that sense uh, again because they they they, they were the uh, first front obviously. Uh, the uh, radio was not recorded in that time frame, so you don't get all, all the recordings from that. But the newspapers were the key. Uh, not only black newspapers, but for example, like the Boston Globe. Again, mm -hmm. there was a, a section uh, 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 called a, 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 it's a society page geared for African Americans. So again, all that information was put forward. Mm -hmm. And again, oh, the, the record, y'all heard that Boston Globe. <laughs> Boston Globe, and there's others too. But again, yeah. the interesting part was the fellow who provided the most information and contact live right around the corner from me when I was growing up. And I didn't know that mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Uh, but again, it was a time frame in which people pull together. And, and in this case, you know, yeah. survive. remember again, certain things you couldn't buy in, in that time frame, And you, and you had, a, a, again, a support, not only food drives, but also in this case, metal drives, yeah. the whole gamut, and even the Boy Scouts were involved in things like that. So the community pulled together uh, yes. because they understood the war. They understood its element because of how we got involved. So that was the big difference. Uh, again, there was, uh, I'll use the term, um, community support for the yes. war, in that sense too. A, a big difference because they understood it. Whether you be old or young, you understood it. Unfortunately, I was a little young at the time. <laughs> I'm a little older now. But uh, yeah. uh, but but again, uh, I still even have the war bond thing uh, that, that, my, that sure. my mother had. Sure. Well, I wanted to just add a little bit to that too. Uh, in both world war, world wars, there was that, uh, I guess, across the board understanding that uh, even though we weren't treated as equal people, we still saw ourselves as part of a country that needed to be defended. And it was so interesting because um, I'm sure many people like myself, if you're totally bored, you might put on your iPad or phone or, or computer and watch YouTube videos. And one of the most popular YouTube videos, of course, how many of you have seen the, the Nicholas Brothers and Cab Calloway? We've all watched it. But if you watch it, it's the end of a film. I think it was Stormy Weather. At okay. the very end of that film, you'll see, buy your war bonds here. Yeah. It's always that last clip at the very end. And I'm always fascinated when I watch people react to that film. Of course, they're reacting to the Nicholas Brothers, number one, but then they'll say, wait a minute, buy war bonds. What is that? This was still, now this is a film 
you know, all of the players in that film, Stormy Weather, you know, this was a black film of the day. Right. And at right. the same time, there was a sentiment that yes, we, and in fact, if you look at the film footage, the people who are in the audience watching the entertainers, they're servicemen. They're men in uniform sitting there with their with their date for the evening and then they're dancing in that last scene. And it was still one that it was understood. Now, turn the clock back to World War One. Still, there was also, you know, liberty bonds. OK, go and buy your bonds to support the country. One of the groups that I research a lot coming out of my home state in Arkansas, the Mosaic Templars of America and the Mosaic Templars. Um, had chapters all over the country, as well as in some Caribbean countries as well. They had raised collectively as an organization, which is a benevolent society, a burial society, an insurance thing. They personally had gone to Washington, D.C., and they're thinking, oh, here's some colored people want to do something. And they took $50,000 to contribute to the war. And then they were just astounded. Here come these Negroes coming in here with $50,000 worth of war bonds that people had supported. And uh, even if you look at a video footage about the history of the Mosaic Templars of America, and they talk about that, how, you know, it was amazing to see how this this community of black people who were supporting the only land they knew is home mm -hmm. and this is our home and so that was public support and it did affect the community in terms of who we perceive ourselves to be even though greater society didn't see us that way but nevertheless there was this sentiment yes we are a proud people ready to defend what we consider to be something that belongs also to us. And so it's it's worthy of note for sure. Thank well, you well, for I that. I want to add one thing, uh, sure. uh, Shelley, relative to the mail. I have the letters that my mother and father wrote back to them in World War II. Really? Awesome. Oh, you should publish those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, a I met a lady at, I think it was at Roots Tech or it was maybe, it could have been the California Jamboree. She's written a book, it's called A Thousand Letters Home. Yeah. And her, I don't know if it was her father, I think it was her father had written these letters home all the time, all the time, all the time. Yeah. And she published yeah. them and you can even find her book on Amazon. And uh, she had this beautiful exhibit at, um, Maybe it wasn't Roots Tech. It could have been at the Jamboree, but an absolutely beautiful exhibit. You can see her book on Amazon called A Thousand Letters Home. And sometimes we don't see letters that often. And I often wish, and many of us as genealogists wish we had old letters that our, our ancestors had left behind. Uh, publish that. I love letters well, well, anyway. Well, <laughs> so As we move forward, I have all of the uh, tapes we sent, my wife and I sent back and forth to each other. Again, uh, because uh, I, I, again, Rather than letters, we in fact uh, you use cassette tapes. The project, oh my gosh! Well, but think about them. This. oh my gosh! This is time to say, talk to the elders in your family, those that were alive. Find out if any of those things are up in that box in the attic or under that bed, and start inquiring about somebody in the military service. So let me go to this question. What challenges do historians and researchers face when trying to uncover and document the role of African Americans in any of these uh, wars or conflicts? Angela? In my opinion, I think, because uh, some of us in the genealogy community, uh, everybody is not, you know, right out of college in their 20s or 30s. Right. But many of us are older people. Um, you know, I'll say 50, 55 plus, yeah. but because, you know, we have a memory, uh, okay, yeah, well, grandpa was in World War One, or my dad was in World War Two. he talks about, yeah, going to Algeria and other places as well, we don't necessarily recognize that the history that we remember, or the facts that we remember about our elders is history now, and I think Sometimes that's the challenge right now to even realize that we have seen people who are part of that history. Now people talk about, oh, the greatest generation and the, the last remaining World War II veterans, if there's still many or any still living. And, 
yeah, it's, I think the challenge we have is to stop thinking of history being just 19th century, right. but we're part of that or our parents are part of it. And sometimes we tend to forget, we want to just go back to 18 something and talk about only that mm -hmm. when, oh my gosh, we've got to think about, you know, we are ancestors of future generations as well. And to really see ourselves as part of history also, I think that's a challenge because sometimes we're still thinking now, now, oh, history is way behind. No, we're part of history too. And our parents are part of history, even though they're part of our memory, whether they're with us or not. So I think that's a challenge to take our way of thinking and realize we're in progression. And at some point someone's going to see us as ancient history as well. So, so so what records when you were researching World War I, your grandfather, correct? Right. What records did you were you seeing? Or did you, did you well think, it's interesting because will come to you, Dr. Brothers. So many of the records are lost, but I had to find out, okay, my grandfather was in uh 809th Pioneer Infantry. Well, let me find out about the Pioneer Infantry. There, there we are go, things that have one. been written about the Pioneer Infantry. And I have a couple of artifacts. I have one of those long three foot long uh regimental photographs where you got like you know, I don't know panoramic yes panoramic <laughs> image of his I think he was company K or something like that uh but and I also have a little something he had sent to my great grandmother you know I have arrived in France I am safe you know a little thing it was like a little a little frilly thing but I had sent to my great grandmother but I had to learn there are things that have been written historically about some of the units so I had to learn about that but transportation records have now been digitized. They're online. That's when I learned what ship uh, my grandfather actually took to France. I also learned about an uncle who I didn't realize until later uh, was also in World War II. He was in a labor battalion and he died in France. And um, I have a picture of his headstone and he's buried north of Paris at saint Miel Cemetery. But um, I have had to really just rely on what scholars have produced, but I also learned the effect on the family because he died in France. He never came home. My great grandmother, Georgia Ann, was a gold star mother. Right. Whoa, that opened up a whole new door. I learned about the black gold star mothers who got a ticket to go to France to visit That's the right. grave site of their loved ones. And guess who accompanied all six of those voyages? The first, Benjamin O. Davis. He accompanied every single voyage of those Black women going to France to visit the gravesite of their loved ones. I learned as I began to research that about the Gold Star mothers, how they were greeted in France by some of the Black expats who were living in France at the mm -hmm. time. And we know a lot of the Harlem Renaissance writers were living in France as well. Uh, and how some of them were really received by U.S. Black expats living in Paris. And um, absolutely amazing because I realized the impact that the war had on their families. They're going to visit the gravesite of their sons, of their husbands yes, who didn't yes, come back. Brothers, yes. And oh my gosh, yeah, of course. And this is now years after World War I was over. This is 1930 when they went to France. Mm -hmm. And so it's still the impact of that loss of the loved one sure. that also impacted these women and and their families. Um, and I didn't realize, whoa, wait a minute, this was my grandmother's brother. She never talked about him. Right. I never heard about it until later. And uh, there was just something in a family letter or something and said, you know, his name, John Lewis Bass. And, you know, and, and a statement that he was buried in France. Oh, I wonder who that was. Well, it turns out it was my grandmother's younger brother. And um, a fact unknown by the yeah. family, yeah. forgotten. We've all grown up in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And most people have no idea. And Didn't even I, know about him. Not at all. And the impact. Here was great grandma Georgia Ann, a gold star mother. She could not travel, but she got the invitation from 
you know, the French government. Which again, um, another record. Another so record. We heard transportation. But number yeah. one, find out about the unit. That's another key thing, talking about someone within the family. So, of course, we got Ancestry, Family Search, and other online databases that people can tap into. But don't forget the social media groups, too, that yes. also are on Facebook. And it yes. could be that it's World War II or this unit or that unit and see what's in your local community. So, Dr. Brothers, what are some of the records and uh, things that you've come across on, on your journey of research? One of the key areas are newspaper accounts. Yes. Again, there are tremendous numbers of newspaper accounts yeah. of soldiers who return and soldiers who've not returned. Uh, the other thing is tombstones. Uh, again, mm -hmm. because in many cases, if you're if, if you're a, a veteran, you have a veteran's tombstone, and there's a record of, yes. uh, supporting that tombstone. Oh, the application. The application yeah. for the tombstone. Yeah. So uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the uh, the other thing for me was draft records. Yeah. Draft records. Again, I uh, I found out that uh, my uh, uh, grandfather married a lady. I didn't realize she was married before until I checked. You know, and, and again, and notice that uh, uh, again, uh, uh, she was the uh, I'll use the term the point of contact, and it was not her name; it was another name. So I found out she'd been married before she married my grandfather. Wow! So, so again, these are the kind of things you can find out. Look at your local libraries; you'd be surprised with the kinds of information they have relative to the various times. Again, because uh, people contributed all kinds of things. Our history center is a classic case in point here in Fort Wayne, as well as the Allen County Public sure, Library. Sure. Um, look at your genealogy groups. Look at your history groups. They have tremendous amounts of information relative to their community uh, because a history is a community thing as well as an individual thing. Absolutely. So, th so those are the kinds of things. One of the key things I wanted to mention about was, again, like our library, uh, we have a room in which you can make a recording a veteran or someone else can make a recording bring bring your senior members there and have them talk about their experiences mm -hmm. and have it recorded in that oh, sense that's yes and, and and it's important well, because they, they the tell museum them, also oh, has that that's good in the center for family history that's you good. can go into the story booth and record and, and that's and that's key because the story is told mm -hmm. by the person in their own words mm -hmm. and then the, the uh, interviewer yeah. if, if they are good really can pull more facts out, particularly what was life like? How did you work? Where did you work? Who were your friends? What were the organizations you were part of? Whether it be the Masons or something else, what church organizations were you a part of? Mm -hmm. In some cases, even the churches have got records associated with it. So awesome, there are many, sources, awesome. many sources of records, yeah. So, so what I want to do is turn this over to Whitney and and Brian, I think if there's any questions from the conference room, Whitney will read them. But uh, Whitney, I'll let you go ahead. And then Angela and Dr. Brothers, I will have one last question. Sure. Is what do you want people to take away from today? So sure. let's do the attendees questions now. Sure, Whitney. please. Yes, we have quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> So one question we have that came from the conference room was how were black women treated in the Red Cross by other Red Cross nurses and administrators? Hmm, that's a question. I don't know if I know that answer. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I might be able to answer that as a dedicated educator and trainer for Red Cross, but I can only talk about present day. So I can't tell you present day there really has not and I started working with Red Cross and volunteering and I handled the military um, connections that was there through the Red Cross and a lot of people might not know what I'm talking about but I actually when we were my husband was military we were stationed in Hawaii and I got involved with American Red Cross because one thing soldiers in order, if they had a family emergency or something was going on, they had to go through Red Cross to make that communication and that connection to their commander to request 
information if someone needed to come home, maybe a baby's being born or whatever was going on in the life. So I don't know if a lot of people know that's a service that Red Cross has had for umpteen years. And so another source of records as well, plus Red Cross had a historical society per se within it, especially when they were overseas. There's records of the um, events that they did. There's typically a unit of Red Cross folks right by an attachment of a military group. So they're not that far, especially overseas. But as far as the treatment for the women, I have not come across anything that I've read about that. And then my involvement as an African-American woman, and I'm going to say from Hawaii to Florida to here to Charlottesville, I have never had any experience with any problems. And number one is because we knew what the mission was. That makes sense. And and that's there's a difference there because we all were about somebody that was part of a fire or being displaced and same awesome. thing in the military. <laughs> and it was also about feeding people and taking care of them and providing services, emergent services, you know, because there was a disaster or whatever it was. So I will research that because now I'm curious because I never heard of anything. So thank you to whoever that was was the question. So next one. And then this person is wondering, can I please share your perspective about the 4,000 African-American soldiers in three all-Black engineering regiments sent to Alaska during World War II to build roads in Alaska? Do you believe the building of those roads played a role in the integrating the military? Just mm. it did. Uh, it was more geared toward the infrastructure for Alaska because they were an integral, uh, an integral unit. They were not participating with some of the others unless uh, there there was a uh, white unit there who was also working at the same time. At that time, no, they were totally separate. At that point in time, even in Europe, that was the case. Uh, again, the uh, African American uh, logistics units were separate. They were not the same. Mm -hmm. I have right. a question as a follow up to that. Would you say something similar about what is it, the triple nickel, the guys who, who would jump out of the helicopters and what have you? Their 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 role was totally different as well. Yeah. But um, uh, I would just be curious in terms of how they're perceived in terms of their their the impact they may have had or. Okay, I, I can talk about the triple nickel because my uncle uh, was part of it. He was a parent. Okay. The triple nickel only served in the U.S. Right. They, they were on the West Coast uh, geared as a defense unit uh, uh, against uh, a Japanese invasion. And they were first, they were the first smoke jumpers. Yes. That's yes. That's true because as, as a parachute unit. So again, uh, they, they were in D.C. I guess about about 10 or 15 years ago and received a uh, again, a unit citation, a unit medal relative to okay. it, because they'd never been recognized specifically. Right. Because they were not a combat unit overseas. Right. They, were, they were stateside, a stateside. And I want to point, well, one thing I, I do want to point out, that, and it may shock a few people, World War II. One of the reasons the Japanese never invaded the West Coast, well, they were part of it, but there was another. The Japanese believed that every uh, male uh, uh, had a gun. Yeah. Literally, and I mean literally, that that that, that they'd be facing a, a you know a, a, an onslaught of, of a militia if they came on board, and that's partially true. Wow, wow, that's that is interesting. interesting. That's interesting. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. Whitney, <laughs> taking that in for a second. Yeah, I, I had to confess <laughs> that, and and uh, and we lived in Hawaii, and and one of the places you couldn't totally go visit and because he mentioned world war ii and you two guys talking about japanese the um middle school that my son went to was right by where koli koli pass was at. oh wow and that's where the japanese flew in, flew in. went under right. went low coming in to bomb pearl harbor pearl and harbor. so forth so and i was trying to think of that you know, and then wow. listening to stories from my dad from World War II and his experiences that happened, because there definitely was the whole discrimination and the tale, 
the whole I'm 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 just gonna there's just so many things that happened during that time. So Whitney, I'll turn it back <laughs> over to you <laughs> and not to get in there too much. <laughs> and then it says during World War II, other than the army, in what other branches of military did black women serve? Hmm. I am not aware that Navy uh, waves, Navy, Navy waves, the waves, Navy. that's Navy true, the waves. I'm thinking um, nurses, that's right. There, there were a small unit of uh, African-American women who actually were in the Marines. Really? Oh. Yes. So Never heard of that. We, 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 no, you won't. You won't hear very much about that. But, but, but again, you, you tend to think about the formation of, of units and how they evolved over time. There's a project. <laughs> And then one, Eddie, of the key there's had, a project. <laughs> one of the key things you have to remember, one of the major roles uh, for the women at that point were nurses. Yes. 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 Were, were the women also involved? In, and, and I'm saying this from a, a, a picture, flag, t the typing in the stuff. Oh, yeah. Were they oh, not yeah. in those rooms also yeah. doing the yeah. typing? And, and again, I'm going blank on some of what I mean, but they were administrative assistant type thing support as well, oh, yeah. well oh, yeah. support yes yeah, support some oh yeah okay whitney <laughs> well i have my and new topic to go breakers. research that was another <laughs> comment thank you karen k <laughs> and it says in the movie oppenheimer there appears a black man who assisted in the creation of the bomb in world war ii who was he and was he the only black person in this operation i'm afraid I, that's one i don't know I have not seen the movie yet. It's oh, it's it, it's coming up on. The, yeah, I just got through American Fiction. <laughs> That's the next one. It's so a very valid question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to go to Google to get that. So, um, but again, that's also going to be Hollywood too. Do I'm your research, folks. You know, if you got some indication of something, do some follow up. Because what we see on the screen, and I'll use glory as a prime example, a mm. lot of things that were in glory were not true. That's or not they good. were turned around a little bit. So again, do oh, your due diligence. Whitney? Do you have any book recommendations about Blacks in World War One and World War II? I recommend one book, and it's called The Negro in World War One. I. I think you can probably find it and uh, I'll find it on Google Books by this time. It's a hardback book, and I may have it downstairs. Um, it's very, very detailed, um, but also I would encourage you to do a little bit of research on, uh, and I'm sure there's been something written in detail about the Harlem Hellfighters. Yep. Anthony Johnson, I believe. Marines. Oh, hold it up again. Yep. Oh. <clears throat> the, 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 this is the Black also, Panthers. Closer okay. to okay. The Black Panthers. Let me get get rid of my background here. <laughs> oh, okay. And okay. you may be able to see it a little better. Yes. But don't forget there was the Montford Marines was another Mumford known Marines. group also. Yes. But but again, it just ends up being the Black Panthers. Yes. And and, and it's the story and it's uh, the seven uh sixty first uh tank battalion. Uh, when, when, you know, again, World War II. And, and the one I mentioned about the uh, uh, pilot, uh, there's a book, and, and, and it's, again, Jacques Ballard, he has a book uh, you know, from World War I. So again, there, there, there are a number of things like that available. Has there been any type of thing written about Anthony Johnson? He was one of the Harlem Hellfighters. He's the one I think who got the Medal uh, Medal of Honor. Yeah, the one <laughs> from World War One. He may have. I just have just. I just just. Not, oh, okay. Not seen, oh. Just not seen it, but okay. I suspect probably There's so. a lot of film footage um, yeah. about him as well that you can find those on on YouTube as well. Another yeah. book is We Return Fighting. Yeah, okay. that's another book, and 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 it's on Amazon. And the other one is the forgotten the untold story talking about black heroes at war. And that was during D-Day. And um, and then, of course, there's one called the Unknown Soldiers, which is African-American troops during World War One. Yeah, and so it. that's just the indication. Google is your friend. Right there. But Go also look to the local and I'm going to say um, units, museums. And and I did research for the 8th Air Force 
uh, out in Arizona, the museum, um, you know, based on my relative doing the research and they didn't have anything at this is several years ago on any of the blacks. And so I was able to submit that, which was a World War II person. So look for the unit museums yeah. and things that are available. And I also want to say that there is um, uh, the museum units. But go to the army.gov or whatever dot mil, and you can get so many questions answered and also guidance to records and resources available. Whitney, the, the other one I want to mention real quick. Oh, go is, ahead. Uh, like Camp Atterbury here in in, in uh, Indiana. Again, that's where many of, of, of the African American units came, infantry units came to be trained. Yes, uh, there's a museum there. And again, there's information at that museum on those units. So it's searching the community for military connected information and, mm -hmm. and historical societies. And you mentioned public libraries, Angela. One final suggestion to look at any digitized images of black newspapers right after World War One. Uh, I was very surprised doing a random search. Oh, this is about, oh, several years ago, doing a random search on the Pioneer Infantries. And several things popped up, links from Black newspapers. We're talking 1919, around that time period, when soldiers were coming back. And mm -hmm. one of the places where um, some of the men who were discharged at Camp Robinson, and there were... Uh, instances as the soldiers after they arrived in New York and where they were going to be sent before they were to receive their discharge. Well, the Black community was hosting receptions for them. And I was very surprised to see in these small little places, well, not small, there were Black folks in Omaha, Nebraska, but places in Nebraska that were welcoming Black communities holding dances for these soldiers coming back. And uh, kind of like a scene from Stormy Weather at the end when the soldiers are dancing, where well, here are these civilians welcoming soldiers of the pioneer infantries coming back to the U.S. So, uh, and uh, you find those local stories in Black newspapers, the ones that have been digitized, take a look at them. It was just really a surprise to see them. Several I had noticed had, you know, come through other East Coast cities and you see similar things that were happening in the Black community, in the cities uh, that did welcome them back. Whitney? And we have some in our reference library here at the museum. I can't think of the titles off the top of my head, but we have the Re-Return Fighting, that one I know we do have, for visitors in the museum that while they're here, they can read. So there's also our website that has them on there as well. So next question is, any records of African women like Nigeria, Ghana, or Senegal involved in World War II? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know. I'll be honest. I I've never know. heard of that. I do know that um, my father would often talk about when he was in Algeria and they would see other African soldiers. And he would talk about um, seeing soldiers from Senegal. Because in North Africa, you have people who ethnically are kind of mixed looking. But he was like, oh, no, but we saw those. He called them Singalese soldiers. They were from Senegal. And he said, oh, no, these were black men who were who were definitely. Uh, and, of course, he was World War II. And, uh, and part of the time he was in North Africa. And that's the first time he saw regiments of Africans. Uh, but he only referred to. Senegalese. Um, there may have been other countries. I don't think so. I don't think the Gold Coast, to my knowledge, did not have troops in World War I. Uh, the Gold Coast being, of course, today's Ghana. And uh, I don't know about Nigeria. I've never heard of it. And I'm trying to think. Uh, Emperor, uh, I'm trying to think of his last name. Um, uh, um, a Black Emperor in World War II. He, he had a force. I just, I'm just trying oh, to. Oh, Haile, Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie. Yes. Haile Selassie. Yes. yes. Ethiopia. That is correct, Ethiopia. actually. Yes, that is true. Yes. So the next question we have is Who were the Black soldiers that freed the Jews at the concentration camp? Oh, and what know. did they do when they got there? 
I have no idea. I, I've seen a reference to a regiment that did go into, I don't know if it was Auschwitz or Dachau or which, but I have seen references. I've never I've never seen. learned anything about those details, though. That would be something worth, worth uh, exploring. Yes, it would be. So this other question we have is someone's trying to find out about the history and info about Camp Jackson in 1918, looking for info about Company A, 429 Labor Battalion from 1918 to 1919, wondering where were they sent during the war, a list of men, addresses, birth dates. They're wanting to put together a database for their community Rosenwald School about World War One veterans. So where just, where's that from? Know. Where's Camp Jackson? Where is that? What state? What city state? What is that? Isn't that South Carolina? Or am I thinking something different? I don't, I don't know. know. The person needs to say because I think where they start is in that community, number one, and then learn about Columbia, oh, South yeah. Carolina, yeah. Vicky. Okay. Thank you. I was, That's what I thought, yes. but I wasn't one hundred percent. I have a suggestion is that if on Ancestry, if you look at the transportation records, you know yes. the name of at least one soldier, find that soldier's name. You're going to find other people in his regiment on that ship. Sure. And it's going to tell you their hometown that they're from. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I remember looking at the ship my grandfather was on going to France in World War One. And he was the only one from his part of LaFleur County, Oklahoma, because there were people from Texas and other parts of, of that, that section of the country who were in his particular regiment. And um, I think if you look at the, at least the transportation records, it gives you the name of the person, their hometown, and who their contact person is. That'll be a guide for you to go ahead and maybe create an Excel spreadsheet so you can go and find them to create a database. I think that's a good activity, though. That's a good project. But use the transportation records on Ancestry. I found a third wife for my uh, grandfather. A and third had wife. No idea. And it was a transportation record. He was in a different, uh, he was in H of the 809th Pioneer. Oh, okay. And they yeah. went to France and, and stuff. So, yes. Go ahead, Whitney. Yep. So, the next thing is. Was Rosie the Riveter pick originally a black woman and was it appropriated like Betty Boop? Oh. <laughs> Ooh. I believe that is correct, but I have not done any research and I'll let someone else but the Statue of Liberty. We we could yeah. go there. Do your research, folks. I do yeah. not know to claim that, you know. I don't know if the original was because yeah. we're generally not the first people in line to get a job. But at the same time, there is an image of, and I think, was it Shelly? Was it you I was talking uh, to about the Black Rosies? Or, yes, um, yes, that yes. was us. There is a, an image of, and I've seen more than one image of a Black woman who was, you know, you see her drilling and welding something. Uh, to say it's the original, mm, I don't know. As I said, we're not the first ones who got, got the job. Uh, so we were probably there was the over six hundred thousand of Rosies. Yes, so there were again over six hundred thousand. So I just don't know. I do. My mother's first cousin, cousin Benny Martin, mm -hmm. she did work in some sort of um, factory during the war. And I don't think she was doing welding or riveting per se, but she did do something that had previously been a man's job, but this was during sure. World War II. Um, and what her role was, I don't know. But I can't say, typically, since we were always, not always the first person hired. Right. So And there could be Latinas also. So possibly. we, we, right. Very we much focus so. a lot yeah. on African-American, but you also have Latinas Very good too. question though. So, okay, Whitney. Worth working and looking the, into that. Yes. <laughs> All these questions are actually pro projects for someone to undertake. A a absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, are there other places to use as substitutes for the 1973 Fire National Personnel Records Center? I think we've kind of mentioned. Yeah, um, you kind of mentioned a lot of that. Um, but you know what's something that I didn't hear? Also look for articles dissertations and things like that on topics and a lot of times again you want to always do local history as well but i that's another 
place and another resource. There could be the Google Books online. I think Brian posted talking about internet archives and other mm -hmm. things that might lead to uh, answer in a, in a correct response. And one thing I also want to say, you should be able to save the chat. If you look at the three dots, you should be able to save the chat. So Whitney, I'm going to turn it back to you because we're running short on time. <laughs> Is there a list of Black Gold Star mothers? Um, the list, uh, and it's only going to be a partial list of those who actually traveled. Now, if you do a Google search, uh, I have a blog called My Ancestor's Name. And um, which you can find at myancestorsname.blogspot.com and just search for the Black Gold Star Mothers who went to France. Yeah. And it's only partial. Use the transportation records. Those are the women who went to France. But you can find uh, among those records, women who did not travel, but who are, who are still among those who received invitations. So use my blog article that I posted about 10 years ago um, as maybe a launching pad to go and, and find others. But the, it's the database of the transportation records, military transport, because it's 1930 of those who went to France. But yeah. the Gold Star program still exists. It still goes on. It still Absolutely. goes on. And people don't realize that. This is not just from World War One no, or two. No. It is still it's a right problem now. that exists. But by all means take a look because they, you know, they they went under um stress too because the white women who went as gold star mothers were given ocean liner voyages and the black women were uh on steamers. Um, and some refused to go when they found out they were going to be treated differently. Exactly. But some who said, I want to still stand at my son's grave. I'm going if I have to stand up the whole way. Uh, but um, there are lists, there were at least six different voyages of those who did go and about 600 women who actually did travel. And um and you and the way to find it, whenever you see one of the passengers, Benjamin O. Davis, oh, this is the group. And you see all the passengers as women, you know, oh, this is one of the voyages that took women to France. And I put the 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 National Museum of African American History. They have a, a section on honoring the Gold Star Mothers and talk about the black. Oh, Gold OK. Mothers. So I put oh, that in wow. chat. Whitney. So the next one is my grand uncles were in World War One, 371st Infantry that was sent to France. Have you seen any extensive research and photos of this group of military men? I haven't really pursued that, so I can't answer the question. I don't. Know. I have not, but I think when you're getting to a specific regiment, often uh, you like one particular regiment. Oftentimes, those become projects that are done for like a master's thesis or a right. dissertation that someone right. has done. So you don't want to overlook those. Uh, Google is your friend now. <laughs> so, case, yes, you know, yes. the question that you're asking, Google it and, and go deep into the list uh, that appears on Google um, just to see what is there. I, for example, uh, my grandfather had a stack of about 10 or 12 uh, postcard pictures of his army buddies. And he identified them all but maybe two. I wrote an article with the uh, their image on my blog, uh, their image, their name, where they were from. And I actually got an email one day from a man who said, oh, my gosh, you have a picture of my mother's uncle, CD. Oh, and um, he had remember asking his mother, is there a picture of Uncle Uncle Seedy? And she said, No, no, we don't have a picture. And said, Well, this woman has a picture on her blog. And he she blew it, he blew it up for her. And she's like, Oh my God, that's my uncle. So um, you know, a lot of times we have things laying around our house and we don't realize that it's a value to someone. Right. And I just wrote an article, you know, these are my dad, my grandfather's army buddies from World War <laughs> One. One was this bunk buddy from New York. Another one was somebody in St. Louis, another another buddy of his from Indianapolis. Um, you know, these are sometimes little projects that can mean something to someone. So. And what you just mentioned is also when you're looking, 
Don't just look for your ancestor. Look at who's around them in those records, military service yes. records and things, yes. because you might find something from their aspect that mentions your ancestor. You know, and yes. I put a, a website also in the chat and it's called facesbeyondthegraves.com. Those folks, um, those are the people over in Belgium. This is one guy that adopted like 10 or 12 different graves, but he also has units that were overseas at the time. He's got airborne, Air Force, Army, and others that he memorializes these American soldiers based on hearing his grandparents tell the story during World War II. So visit there. You'll actually see my relative under the Air Force, uh, Calvin Clark Davis. So Whitney. So it goes, should we supply our ancestors World War I and World War II documents to the 10 Millions Name Project? How will that help other genealogists? I'm going to... I'm going to say we need to pass on that because the 10 million names is reflecting more of enslaved individuals yeah. and not more modern time, but that's a whole nother conversation on mm. that project. So yeah. I'm going to come back to you, Whitney. And, and again, that's not the focus of the 10 million. Right. Names. That's true. That, that's why I'm saying that. For those that lost their lives, are there any stories of the families they left behind and what they endured, like home loss, not receiving benefits, and et cetera? Yes, hundreds. Hundreds. Where would be a good place to start looking? You to start out looking for most are unpublished. Un unpublished, but local. You got to hit local. I know the Library of Virginia in Richmond actually a couple years ago did a whole theme. And even though they were looking at just folks from Virginia, but they had some of the stories like when they came home, the research was addressing what happened after World War II folks came home. And so you would have read about those things and I don't see anything published, but that was just my experience doing World War I and World War II research. And it's also a call to action, though, too. Yes. It's one thing to say, oh, nobody's written anything about it. Then it's an opportunity for you to write about it. We've got to become assertive and become really proactive and see ourselves as individuals. If we don't know the stories, maybe we can go and find the stories. Let's and talk to the elders. Let's, yeah. Well, what was it? Oh, wow. Your uncle never came back. What was the impact of that? Did your grandmother ever talk about it um um you know ask those questions there's still time to do it and um you know that and you know i like the example that that shelly just gave of the man in france who's adopted eight or ten soldiers from a cemetery but guess what we're surrounded by national cemeteries right here yeah. and i live within three miles of two national cemeteries uh baltimore national and loudon national and there are over 135 civil war soldiers there there are a bunch of vietnam soldiers at baltimore national and you know adopt some you know uh a friend of mine and terry and, always, or just tell their story with your genealogy groups Absolutely. And we can become assertive and do that because the next generation is going to ask the same question. Are there any stories about the soldiers who came back? Well, let's pay it forward to that next generation who's going to ask that same question. Absolutely. Whitney? That one goes, which war between World War I and World War II, were there a greater loss of life of Melated people, I believe is what it says. Melanated, is that what Melanated, it? maybe it's that. People of color. Vietnam. Yeah, that's what I, I said Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam. Vietnam would probably be it. Vietnam, yeah, they're absolutely. They're trying to decide between World War One and World War Two specifically. Oh, I don't know that yeah. answer. I don't, uh, Vietnam has got the overall hands down. Right, because we were actually combat, direct combat. Probably, maybe World War Two. I don't know, Doctor Brothers, because uh, not that be well. the, between those should be World War Two. Yeah, yeah, I would think because even those who were either severely injured or lost their lives in World War One, a lot of them were fighting for France because we couldn't fight for the yes. U.S. 
So, so Whitney, I'm going to ask a favor, and and it's after two thirty. Yeah, I have and to we're go. We're usually soon. done, <laughs> and I know people are in the conference room in the museum. But I want to give those of you, we've got your questions and and whatever ones you have less, we'll try to address them, um, you know, maybe in the chat or, you know, the forum when it goes up on YouTube, we can respond to that. So look within a week or so for this recording to be up because I don't want to delay folks too much longer. And I want Angela and Dr. Brothers to give one more takeaway. And that is, what would you want people, if you had to choose from what we discussed today, what would be the one thing that you would suggest to someone thinking about World War I, World War II, Vietnam, the takeaway from today's discussion? My, well, for, go ahead. Okay, well, for me, uh, the all the wars solidified our notion of an American equal for all in that, in that sense, too. The men and women who serve return to their communities energized and idealized for what they can and should be doing. So, again, it allow us to coalesce together uh, again uh, and uh, create those discussions and make plans for the future. And again, that's where the Urban League, the NAACP and other organizations come into play. Thank you for that, Angela. I would just want to remind people that it's not that long ago mm -hmm. and we have a closer connection to those men and women who were part of those engagements, whether it was one of the two world wars or whether it was Vietnam and let's not forget Korea and let's not forget Desert Storm and all of the other things that have happened since that time and are still happening now. It's not that long ago. And I would just say, you know what? There's still a story to tell. And we are history for our descendants. So I think we need to become proactive and see ourselves as the storytellers that we are and to try and collect them, to find them and tell them. Tell the story. That's way. the key. Yeah. Beautiful way to end this. And, and um, I do see one thing in the chat. Mary, Google Faces Beyond the Graves. Make sure you're putting the S on there and .com. But it's Faces Beyond the Graves with an S, .com. And so, Whitney, any parting words from you? Mainly just, it will be available on the museum's YouTube channel, not on the museum's website. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, did man. I say website? No, this is oh, just okay. some people saying that they've been looking on the website to find it. No, that's yeah. just clarifying it's on the YouTube channel, not the website. And, and I'm sorry to close it out, but I know people have time and appreciate <laughs> our guests spending time with us and the people in the museum. So I just want to say thank you. We will be back on March 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that topic will be with the guest of Family Search. What does Family Search have for African Americans to be able to conduct research? So I want to thank everyone, thank the panel, thank Whitney and Brian there, and y'all have a good day. <laughs>